So, you wanted to talk a little bit about training. That is an area in which we had spent oh, probably 15, 20 years, so <laughs> we must have... I was thinking in terms of what we're in agreement in and the field isn't really uh, still along that line. And I think we do train differently than most people in the field. Well, go ahead, shoot. What, what are the things that you see us? Well, I think we were probably the first to, uh, in the family field, to put a large emphasis on skill, on being able to do something skillfully in the therapy. In contrast to those who fell and still do, that if you go solve your own family's problems, you will somehow magically know how to cure other families. Well, there are actually three approaches, really. Uh, one that says if you learn enough about the theory and about the theory of change, uh, then you will be able to implement uh, the techniques uh, or innovate in techniques. Uh, we were very inductive. We started with let's teach skills. And the idea was after that, there will be a moment in which the skills will all kind of fall into places. Sure. And the theory then will be an aha experience. So that, that were the two things. Sure. I don't know that I am there now, mm -hmm. you see. Where I, are you now? Well, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I think that a little bit in the middle, uh, still very much involved in, uh, in teaching skills, uh, but kind of, uh, I, I think that I had been shocked sometimes by what people learn uh, from the teaching of skills. You know, when, when you, and the idea that, okay, structural family therapy had to do with changing distances, uh, and, and then they would change distances of people or, or positions of people or, uh, you know, I had seen students of mine that are very, very proficient at executing a maneuver and nonetheless don't think clearly about where do they go with this maneuver. And when I began to see that, then I began to say, okay, something was skewed. True. But you're, you're into a more subtle difference than I'm thinking of. We, you remember that large meeting we had on training, which we estimated about 1970? It started out to be a meeting of family therapist trainers. It was going to be 20 or 30 people. And then some of the trainers said they wanted to bring their students to talk about their experience in the training. It was on training? It was on training, absolutely on training, yeah. Oh. And Mariano Berrigan organized it. So they began to bring their students, and it began, then people who were just interested in training wanted to come. And it ended up there were 900 people at that meeting. It was, it was a fantastic many. meeting. And there was something I like... I remember mostly the fights. <laughs> no. Well, there was about 20 workshops. We gave each training group a morning to present their uh, procedures. I remember now, yes. And I was horrified. I, I found that 90% of them were having people as training simulate their own families. And that was the only training oh. people got. I remember a group from Boston where the students spent a year simulating their own families and never saw a family in therapy. And it was so shocking to hear the way these people were emphasizing everybody's own family. You know, when Freud suggested that a few months analysis might help somebody get over his biases, this has become ridiculous. I mean, an analysis that became a seven-year training analysis, and all these people now feel if you analyze your own family, examine it, explore it, and so on, then if you get a family in with a problem, you'll be able to cure them. Uh, now, I don't think we ever thought that the per affecting the personal relationship of a family 
would teach them how to do therapy. Do you know, here's a problem that I think is a legal problem now. There is one place that requires, in order to get your degree, that you go through family therapy. Just like the traditional, you have to go through a training analysis and analysis. This means that the wife of somebody who wants to become a therapist has to go through therapy. Not only the guy, but his wife and his kids, which is a, an involuntary therapy. I mean, I think that's illegal, really. That means this is part of the training. It's a requirement for the degree. That you have family therapy of your own family. In fact, I get a letter about once a month from somebody protesting that to get their degree, they have to go through therapy. It's usually individual therapy. And can anything be done about this? But I don't think uh, we ever assumed that changing a, pers a therapist's personal family would teach him how to deal with families. So that was a difference is what I was thinking. And that's still very big in the field. But I think that that you have a lot of impact in the clinic in terms of how to think uh, about training. Uh, I think that these were some of the things that you introduced. Uh, this was a period in which uh, you came uh, and uh, very soon after you came, uh, you introduced some of the ideas that we did not have. Uh, and I th think that a lot of the things that you uh, introduced in this early period uh, became the way in which we were training people. Uh, so I remember one of the things that you were introducing was a kind of a respect for the student. And that respect meant a kind of clear boundaries in terms of supervision and intrusion into therapeutic intrusion. Uh, the, you brought some rules uh, that we uh, accepted. Uh, what else? Uh, you had some of the ideas that people could not, that the, the observing students could not challenge a supervisee unless they have another idea that was better. Sure. Uh, so there were... The rules behind the mirror. You know, yeah, the th there were some interesting things. I think that a lot of them had to do with individual boundaries and with respect. That was rather interesting because for a guy that in the field cultivated a persona as an uh, 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 iconoclastic and irreverent and disrespectful, uh, that was one of the things that I needed to defend at you in the field. The people would say, well, Jay is uh, blah, 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 but this blah, blah, blah meant he is disrespectful, he is intrusive, he is uh, uh, challenging. And I would say, well, you know, he's not like that in training. He is a very respectful guy. He is actually very protective. Uh, and that shocked people. Yeah. I remember uh, defending you from much the same accusations as me. <laughs> that is that you were intrusive and abrasive. But that was true. <laughs> you see, I, I don't think that you were intrusive and abrasive, no. except, in, except in, in, in writing. Well, all my style as a supervisor and as a therapist was intrusive and sure. abrasive. Uh, part of from where I came uh, as a therapist, uh, in working, how, how the heck did I learn to do family therapy? You know, it was the the black and Puerto Rican families taught me, and the way that they, what they taught me was that in order to combat their despair, I needed to introduce some of my affect. And, and that became really my way of working. Uh, I, I entered into battle with people, you know, in a Calvinistic way. Uh, isn't, 
Well, what you used to do is enter and upset everybody and be abrasive and then renegotiate and come out with them all pleased with you. And many of your students could get in there and be abrasive, but they didn't do so good on the renegotiating. Uh, but it was this, this thing that I will make you happy regardless of you. It's interesting how much of a person's therapeutic style is determined by his clientele. Uh, oh, I was thinking of that. There, there's been an accusation that you tend to uh, support the men in relation to women and families by some of the feminists. And I was thinking that part of uh, that, whether it's so or not, is that when you're working with the poor and the black, and the women have an income and the men don't, and the men are down in the hierarchy, there's a natural tendency in restructuring the family to build the men up in relation to the women. And I think that was partly determined by the clientele. Well, no, it, it was also determined, you know, by my own background in a very patriarchal society. and. Uh, uh, but you've recovered from that, surely, haven't you? Absolutely. <laughs> well, you know, it is... Uh, Marion Walters once, uh, she, she was helpful in that. Because I would say, you know, that really I don't have an, uh, a gender bias. Uh, and then she said to me one day, this was after uh, I came from a sabbatical, look at the structure of the clinic. And I looked at the structure of the clinic, and every head of a unit was a man. And that was a shock. Uh, and so I proceeded after that very deliberately to create a change on that structure. But clearly that was true. Uh, and that was, it is true because that was my, uh, my way of seeing. It was true also because uh, the therapist enters into uh, to deal with families that belong to a certain culture. Sure. And uh, the families that I was seeing are, were families in which uh, I experienced the possibility of redress the balance, produce uh, upsetting the, the equilibrium of the family, was entering uh, in and putting the men as a separator. You know, I think that I have been very supportive of the women's uh, group uh, because I think that they are stirring a significant corner of the family therapy technique. Uh, I think so do you. And, and so I have been very supportive. So I, I really think that you don't need to defend me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had I acknowledge my sins. I ask for forgiveness. <laughs> <laughs> Have you done penance? That's great. I had done penance and I am different now. <laughs> so what happened in your coming is that you introduced in the clinic and into my thinking some ideas about indirection. Uh, that my you were uncomfortable with indirection. Then. Absolutely. My approach was uh, straight. I go. I battle, I struggle, and I survive, and the family survives also. And that is honest, and it is part of the kind of encounter that is straight and honest in which. Sure. Uh, so that the ideas that you introduced very early in the game, uh, the ideas of prescribing the symptom, and the ideas about uh, what were the things uh, about uh, don't rush uh, in changing restraining restraining people, sure. yeah. uh, and indirect this, influence of various kinds yeah. yeah this all these ideas were new and well you know when i first i don't know whether we ever discussed it really but when i first came to the clinic i came out of a background of working with families with a schizophrenic but also out of some years of private practice in an ericstonian style of therapy and I'd studied with him for many years. And I could see that the way I was working would be totally inappropriate in the clinic. So I really didn't teach any of those ideas or make use of them. Uh, no, you did. Very much. No, 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 you did. No. You see. Well, I, I felt that when I left there and came here, I began to do much more that I hadn't been doing in the clinic, but I had done 20 years earlier. You know, no, no, you, you did. 
You see, I think that uh, your influence in the uh, clinic where that influences of introducing some of the ideas of indirection, and uh, and I learned them, you know, and, and all other kinds of people. The other people learn them also. So you know, in that is where I said to Rich Simon that you were my teacher, and uh, and I transcended you. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's very simple. Well, I can give you an example. You know, an interesting example of the different way of working. When I visited you at Patterson House way back in the early 60s, and I watched you and Braulio work with a family, and it was wo a woman with, a black woman without a front tooth, and she held her hand up in front of her face. She had a couple of kids, one of them in the place for delinquency. And you were working with the family, and Braulio uh, was behind the mirror. I forgot what you were doing, but you were doing a, a family therapy around helping the woman to become more in charge of the kids or something. Mm -hmm. And I watched that and I was interested because I was going around the country watching all therapists, how they were working. But your group asked me what I would do with that family. And I remember saying that I would say to the boys that their mother didn't have a front tooth and that she was very shy because of that. She held her hand up as they could see. And that I wanted them to, I wanted her to go to a dentist and find out how much it would cost to have a front tooth put in. And I wanted the boys to earn the money to provide that front tooth. And it had to be honestly. They couldn't do anything dishonest because the mother wouldn't accept that. And that the task of the family was for the boys to provide the front tooth of mother so she wouldn't be shy, so she could get involved socially and get a boyfriend and so on. And I, that group looked at me like I was a nut, really, <laughs> for putting the whole emphasis on a front tooth in that family, yeah. when clearly the whole structure was in trouble and the whole thing, you know? I don't remember that. It shows you how we construct reality. <laughs> <laughs> I am sure that, this, that, that your memory is correct. But I, I don't remember that you went, that you were in Patterson. Oh, yeah, I came there to visit yeah. one afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. I was looking for a paper for the journal. I was going everywhere hunting for papers and encouraging people to write them and so on. You know, we were hungry so for something. Your pilgrimage uh, came a number of years, probably, or maybe after we did a pilgrimage. I went to MRI. I went to uh, Lyman Wynn, and I went to Leeds uh, after having instituted the family therapy mm -hmm. uh, program in the clinic. And at MRI, I remember, what I remember was that uh, you told me not to watch uh, Bateson because he was boring, because he did not believe in change. Uh, and so I didn't, and I went to look at Virginia. And Virginia was teaching straight communication teaching, mm -hmm. uh, how people should learn how to read each other's communication and so on. I went to Leeds and to our surprise, Leeds was not doing family therapy. Not at all, no. Uh, they, they were doing these individual interviews and then the collage of the things. I knew but the social worker who did the individual yeah. interviews. But you know, but they were writing family therapy. And then we went to uh, Lyman Wynn that at this point was doing a kind of therapy that was heavily psychoanalytic. Uh, then. So that then we returned. It was uh, Dick Howard and myself. We returned with a sense that we were at the top of the world. <laughs> <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that there were, wasn't much competition. That was, yeah. That <laughs> now this was our training, you know, sure. because we had begun to do family therapy without knowing. Sure. Now we were going to learn. Yeah. And what we learned was that the field was really uh, very, very scarcely populated. Well, when I wrote that paper in 62 to review the field, there was hardly anybody. And there was no literature at all that I could call upon, you know. There were half a dozen people uh, who sort of did it. But they also didn't know about each other. Erickson had been doing family therapy. He listed himself as psychiatrist and family counselor in 48, 1948, you know, 
So he'd started very early with families. And also the MRI, uh, you know, Virginia began training. She was probably the first trainer in family therapy. Yeah, she started in 59 program. with a one-way mirror room and the whole bit. And yeah, we, we saw They had a grant, and Jackson got her a grant to do that. And that was a, the beginning of the way of working behind a mirror with a group and people taking turns going in and so on was routine. You know, I have a fantasy that I did the first uh, supervision in with videotape in a very unusual situation. Nathan Ackerman was doing an, uh, a presentation in the Academy of Medicine, and I was the consult. I, I was the discussant of Nathan Ackerman's paper, and that must have been very, very early uh, in the 60s. And uh, I just went and, in my grandiosity, because I was a young tar Turk, and I just took his, uh, his interview, and instead of being like any other consultant, graceful, you know, and gracious, uh, more gracious than graceful. I was neither one or the other. And I kind of supervised Nathan Ackerman from my position of being really uh, very much a junior person and owing to Nathan Ackerman a tremendous amount. But clearly at this point... You I mean owing him personally? Oh yes. I, I, he had been extremely helpful to me when I came to the country in 52 to 54. So that uh, why I did that, I don't know, but it seemed to me that it was the first time in which I began to think about how to do supervision, uh, and, and supervision of style, of therapy style, sure. using the videotape uh, that today is, of course, to me, the most significant way of uh, supervising, of supervising a therapist, because uh, when I do supervision of uh, life supervision, uh, I am uh, influenced by the need to produce an outcome in the family. Sure. But if I want to study the style of the therapist, then I go to. Sure. But first, let me put here on on the. Uh, on the tape, uh, the fact that your influence in the clinic and in my development was very, very important, and that my first sabbatical really served as a way of putting distance. See, uh, I could not think very clearly because you seem to have a number of ideas about training and so on that you had brought from MRI. And the uh, well, Bateson's project and Erickson, really. Yeah. yeah I, I the MRI, I was never really involved with in training at all. Well, I think that it was a lot of them from Erickson. And that I felt very uncomfortable because you were tremendously clear in your teaching. You know, that's one of the things that you have a tremendous clarity to present certain ideas. And, uh, and so my sabbatical was very, very useful. I needed to be a way to think uh, on my own, so that my development of uh, structural family therapy in some way was also a way of differentiating uh, myself from Ian Browley. Uh, in, in some way, you were very significant in the development of ideas. Well, you know, one of the things that, uh, that happened, as I recall it, is that you invited me there to work with you because you were lonely. I think you wanted some more family people. And you didn't have any family people, really, uh, I was, when you were just I 20. was looking like crazy for uh, good people to bring, you know. It was... Uh, well, you'd, you'd come there in 65 and lost, what, 95% of your staff yeah. and turned it into a family therapy place with a, with a poor community as the clientele, which it had never had. So your staff was, really couldn't survive. I think I was one told me that you were unhappy at MRI really? and that maybe 
and you wouldn't lose. I was dissatisfied there in a way because the 60s were developing the, and I was getting more interested in what was happening in the world. And in Palo Alto, there was a feeling the social problems were what other people had, you know? Yeah. And the idea of going to work for the poor in Philadelphia, where there's a lot of poor, was very appealing. No, there were no poor in Stanford. Well, there were a few. There was a little pocket that were used for research purposes of, of poor people, but they weren't really a major issue over there at all. Yeah. You don't realize it until you come to Philadelphia and go back, and you realize it's so different out there. At any rate, the agreement we made was that I didn't have to do anything I didn't want to do, and that I didn't have to write any grant proposal, which I'd been living on. I'd been running a family research that. project for I five years. That. Yeah. And I'd had enough of that. Did I offer you a job saying that you don't need to do anything? Absolutely. You don't want? That's right. That was the agreement. Wasn't that extraordinary? It was <laughs> extraordinary, yeah. So I didn't teach when I went there. And I wasn't thinking of myself as a teacher at all, of family therapy, certainly. I was a researcher, and I was going there to research the poor and the black, really. Uh, I was, we were, several of us were thinking of a longitudinal study. And I was going to, and we were going to do it in collaboration to increase our sample. And I was going to work with the poor. And I went there primarily for that and ended up just doing that research with films. And so on. But after a year or two, you then began to say to me, look, you've got to do something around this place for your salary. This, you spent two years? Oh, a year, year, a year, maybe two years just researching and fooling around. How could I have been so <laughs> <laughs> And then you encouraged me to do something, and that's when I started teaching, and that's when I began to influence that. But I hadn't thought of myself as a teacher at all up to that point uh, of therapy. I mean, I taught seminars here and there, but not really in a systematic, supervised way. Well, I think that uh, what happened to you also then is that uh, you moved from um, abstract ideas that into the practical end, yeah. to really an understanding of the small details right. of uh, therapy. And I think that that was the beginning of your, uh, the erosion of your confidence. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you then, I, I think that instead of criticizing others, and that was very useful, I am sure, sure, instead of criticizing what other people were not doing, you began to, to begin to do sure. certain things. But right? well, you know, one of the things I most admired about you uh, was both your courage to, to handle the situations you were handling, but also the way, the practical way you worked with families. And, and I remember what may have been the first time you went in a room. I recall Abner Barkai, the Israeli, who was a child fellow, and he was dealing with a family with a mother and a daughter. And the 16-year-old daughter had stayed out overnight. It was a poor and black mother and daughter. And the mother and daughter were screaming at each other, and, and Barkai was trying to quiet the mother and trying to quiet the daughter. And you and I were behind the mirror. And finally, Bark, I just said, help. <laughs> and he looked at the ceiling. <laughs> and you walked in, and you sat Bark, I over to the side. And you said to the daughter, go to the bathroom and wash your face. So the daughter went out to go to the bathroom to wash her face. And the mother said, what are you doing with my daughter? And she apparently thought you were taking your daughter away from her. And you said, come with me. You knew that explaining wouldn't do any good, apparently. You said, come with me. You took her down the hall. You opened the door to the woman's bathroom. You pointed to the daughter in there washing her face and said, that's where she is. Shut the door and took the mother back. Then the daughter come in, and they be you began to negotiate a conversation between them instead of yelling. And then you left, and Bark, I took over again. Uh -huh. And I thought that was really something to watch. There were two things I was impressed with. One, the confidence you went in there with. You didn't have any doubt that you could hold, solve that situation. And the other was how quick you saw that mother had to be taken to that bathroom to see that daughter. I would have explained to the mother the daughter's perfectly all right, all that, you know. But she didn't work that way. Well, you see, this is, this is uh, the product of the thing that the families train me. You know, schizophrenic families do not train you this That's right. way. But poor families, and families with young children train you to see concreteness. Yeah. You know, and I think that this is still my major strength, uh, the fact that I am absolutely convinced that I can enter and they will do something to me and I will do something sure. to them, and that in the process 
something will happen that will give me a clue to the direction where I am. Yeah, it's that confidence that you'll be able to do something and survive it, you know. Well, I mean, some of those families were pretty rough. You know, I, I, am, I try to teach people that. You know, and, and the best that I can do is to say to them that if they trust their own dependency on the family, that the family will lead them in some way. Uh, I, I, I trust their, what do you mean trust their own dependency? Well, you see that I will enter and I will push. And that they will tell me how far I can push, in what direction I will push. Mm -hmm. And pretty soon they will construct the direction in which I need to go. Uh, I, I never wait. I think that I cannot construct data except if I am in kind of uh, in proximity, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and, and so I don't believe that there is one way of doing things. Uh, and one of the things that I admired in you and that I uh, am not doing is that you would be able to say to a student, you know, from the other one we mirror. Do that. Well, I need to enter into the room and do it, and learn through the do it, mm -hmm. doing it, and then I, I can leave. And the student had learned through my modeling. But information, I gather through the contact. Uh, you know, I... It, it with a con personal contact with the family. personal contact, yes. The mirror screens out a lot, yeah. that's true. Uh, but there's another reason why in, and that is you get bored behind the mirror. Yes. <laughs> you get impatient and bored and you want to get in there, so you go in and then you yeah. produce a theory about why it's a good reason why you went in there. Oh, well, but I, I know it's personal, yeah. you see, uh, because I, I had seen uh, that it's unnecessary. Um, but everybody develops a way of supervising that's personal. Mine, to keep a distance from it all and to stay behind the mirror is my way of doing it. Getting in the middle of it is your way of doing it, really. Yeah, uh, clearly, then, my, um, the, the therapy that I develop is, is a therapy of, of small movements. I am concrete. Uh, I, I, I watch. I don't listen as much as I watch. Uh, I think that clearly, my channel of information is uh, watching. And then what I listen are patterns. And that also is probably the result of the fact that I'm a foreigner. And that uh, language. Could help that, certainly. It, it, it is, to me, it has sure. become a helpful way of doing it. Sure. Uh, that I listen to, rep to repetitions. I listen to process. And that's why kind of it's strange to me that what I had written about structures is seen as static because I I am very much a process oriented therapy. That's true, yeah. Uh, and I impose on process some ideas about structure, that it's sure. all in, imposing on that. Well, there's an incompatibility between the idea of hierarchy and the idea of systems that everybody is struggling with, trying to handle. How, how do you see that? Why? I get more linear. <laughs> of course, of course. Because yeah. if you think so hierarchically, you think linearly. Yeah. Of course. At the same time, you have to realize that patterns keep repeating, which is the systematic view. Yeah. But, you know, that was one of the things that I did not understand about um, Bateson. You know, Bateson attended the cybernetics conferences in the late 40s. And they were an interesting way of introducing the idea of homeostasis to uh, a whole variety of people, the anthropologists, the biologists, the psychiatrists, the sociologists, all attended these meetings. And Bateson tended to, because he was teaching in the Psychiatric Institute in 
San Francisco. He tended to introduce these ideas into psychiatry, and then he started his project. And uh, actually, we met Norbert Wiener, who, who made some greatly admired. And then he introduced this idea of systems as the, at the same time as we began inadvertently to begin to look at families of schizophrenics, so that the ideas came together. But the idea of a homeostatic system has nothing to do with therapy. One of the ways I differ it, it it's, it's a nice way to describe a family and make sense out of repeating patterns that keep occurring. If you're going to step in and change it, I don't think it's a helpful idea at all, really. It's, it's a theory of stability and but, how not to change. But even there, Jay, the concept of complex systems is a concept of substructures. Sure. It's, it's a concept of uh, boundaries and hierarchical arrangements of substructures. Uh, the concept of systems that are not organized like that is at the point in which you go macro and you talk about the cosmos, or at the point in which sure. you go f as, phys uh, as physicist and you deal with sure. the uh, quarks or whatever it is that they deal with, you know. But at any point in which we are dealing with families, really we are dealing with uh, complex systems that are rather limited and so we well, that, that we arbitrarily define the limitations of. Yes. We put yes. it around the child, or mother-child, or father-mother-child, or father-mother-child-grandmother. Yeah, because we, we need to influence them. Sure. And if you think systemically, then, uh, at s or you are a participant in which, like we are, an intervener or a meddler, and then we said, okay, the family, and we put a period, or we are sociologists, and we said, society and so on, or we are politicians, or we are philosophers. A and then there is no, no power, no hierarchies. Uh, we are dealing with symbols. And when we deal with symbols, then it's OK. And then there well, is that's no where power. Bateson was, really. Absolutely. Bateson, that was his field. Uh, absolutely. That is sure. why Bateson did not understand the idea of power, because he was dealing with uh, um, with logic. Not sure he didn't understand it. He didn't like it. <laughs> That's different. <laughs> but you no, know, I think that he didn't like that, the idea. Yeah. Uh, that that one person can influence sure. another, particularly indirectly. That's why he was uncomfortable as could be with, with Erickson, while at the same time admiring Erickson and his skill and so on. Miss the idea that one person can control the system is a systemic, certainly. Sure. Since he is part of the system. But right. that is what all therapy is about. And you have to have a base outside that system in yeah. order to control that system yeah. that you're controlling. That's right. But it may be that Bateson didn't like the idea that you uh, hypothesize the therapist being independent of the system and therefore able to change it. He didn't like, he liked the idea that the therapist was part of the system. That is, there was no place to stand out there. Yeah, and, and while all the therapy that I do is one in which I am close to the family and then I cannot control them, sure. then they control me, and then I am distant of the family, and at which point I am meta system and I control the system. And sure. it is that movement that I do. Well, I think Bateson's, as I recall it, was interested and uncomfortable with the paradox that to be a therapist, you have to be part of the system and independent of the system simultaneously. Yeah. And that if you're too much part of it, you're just palsy mousy. If you're too independent, you don't have any empathy for the people. And to be both at the same time, is a hard thing to think about. It's well, a paradox, yeah. really. Well, you know, the question is that it is thinking, as a therapist, we, we work linearly. Absolutely. And, and this is uh, in Which life. is shocking to students. <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah, that means we, are, we think systemically. Yeah. And, and we work linearly. linearly. That's right. Absolutely. You cannot otherwise. 
And, and to get that idea over to trainees is very difficult when they're, when they're intellectuals. It's a problem. It's a problem to get that idea over. You know, one idea that I find interesting, I try to teach my students something that is very simple. I, I said to uh, family members, uh, you change him or you change her. And the family members said, well, how can I change him or how can I change her? I can only change myself. And I said, no, you cannot change yourself. Nobody can change oneself. But you can change her. You can change him. Now, for families this is shocking because the idea always is that there is only one can change oneself and so on. But I am trying to teach that to students. So I take and I draw the yin yang and I said, listen, these are not two. This is one. He and she are one. Now if I said to he that she should change that he should change her, but they are one, how can that happen? And whenever I do that, I find myself with students of uh, Mori Bowen that says that bring immediately the scale of differentiation, or with students of Carl Whitaker that tell me that, uh, you know, uh, Carl says that spouses should not be the therapist of each other, or students of Freud, you know. But this idea uh, that requires, that is, I think, a systemic idea that is that people are the context of the other. It's a difficult one. Sure. You know, one of the ways I teach it, how do you? Is I get a student who is unable to initiate, which is the hardest kind of a student to deal with, really. They can't initiate action with this, with the family. And one of the things I ask them to do is to talk to the family about changing, to say, do you really want to change? And are you committed to changing? And then to say, are you willing to make a sacrifice to change? And when the family says yes, they then turn to the student and expect the student to deliver something. And the student is obligated to deliver something once he's set that up. So that the way a student changes his behavior is by setting it up so the family requires him to change his behavior is the way I think of it. Mm. I wouldn't teach them how he should do it. I, I set it up so he has to do it in relation to the family. Well, then, you see, here uh, I think that I have, uh, I do, uh, we, we differ there. Uh, because I think that I am teaching them something about the concept of, um, of belonging and of being a part. Uh, that it seemed to me it's a very uh, difficult concept for people that have been trained, like all our students have been, or that had experience uh, always, the need to protect their individuality. Uh, it seemed to me that the uh, very simple, to me at this point, the very simple idea that people are a part that is the basis of all system, it's a radical epistemological change and that people do not sure. do not get it. Particularly clinical people. Yeah. Who've been trained to diagnose it as if this is independent of that, that action. Yeah. So I I talk, uh, I, I make diagrams. Uh, you know, in in family kaleidoscope I played around with the idea of a diagnosis uh, of three people as being one diagnosis that I like. It's yeah. It's a kind of a playful kind of idea that there is three people that have one diagnosis and so uh, now that's a, we need that eh? we need that as a diagnostic system that's yeah it. well I don't know if we need it I it certainly uh, I, I it would be very very complex yeah. but you know the, uh, the uh, there is a difference between us around educating people. But yeah. I think you would teach a student that he's part of it, and I would try to get him to do something which he would only do if he was part of it. So oh. that the action itself is a realization of it. Now, 
which maybe is similar to the way I would do therapy. What you you tend to be more educational than I am. What you did, you s what you did, graft the educational aspect. Would you then verbalize? Would you then create a, no. a, an understanding for them? Well, if they ask, maybe, but not otherwise. I don't think. I don't think it's necessary for the behavior to be perpetuated. No. I think once they're successful getting a family to do something, after the family's required them to do something, but, then they'll do it again. But what about the generalization of that idea? You see, sure, you need to question. move it. You need to move it from the experience in this situation to an okay, uh, the aha. Okay, that is something that takes many forms and takes many shapes, and I can do it in different styles, and, and so on. What about the jump from the experience to the integration? It's the same issue in therapy yeah. as in training. They're absolutely formally the same. No, because your goals are different. In what way? Well, I think that the goals with the families are goals for expanding the reality so that they can try alternative ways that feel comfortable and then an expectation that that change will generalize and so on and so forth. I think that I see students differently. Uh, in some way I see students also in my goal of, uh, of building a pyramid of people that change other people. I see the need for them to to conceptualize, to integrate this kind of thing. Uh, then in their supervision, I, I don't know. I, I see that uh, as an, uh, as a different well, it's goal. It's the same issue in this sense that if you if you get in a family to do something different in the room, you want them to generalize it so they do something different outside there. They introduce more complexity into their lives by carrying what they do in therapy into more interesting things That's in their life. Yeah. With students, you want... They, but they don't need... They really... You are introducing a perturbation, you are introducing a change, and your theoretical expectation is that that will generalize. Right. Even, even you, don't, you don't care in what direction it will generalize or it, it will grow. Uh, it's unpredictable to some yeah. extent, that's right. Yeah. Well, now, with a student, you yeah. want them to do one thing with a family, which when a, a different but similar family comes in, they'll think of something different but similar to do with them. That they'll have somehow have learned from this experience to do it with other families. Yeah. Well, they, now that's a question, how much that has to be conceptualized yeah. and how much you, yeah, they I, just do it. You see, I, I, I really see that uh, in order for that to be generalized in the student, to be generalized in such a way that he innovates, that it's different, that the same situation occurs formally, but it is so different and nonetheless is the same, that he sees it, and then he introduces the same operation that is nonetheless completely different, so it's tailor-made, that in order for that to happen, I work on uh, teaching. How did you learn it? I learned it from watching slow motion films of families and therapists, I think. Okay. That it was so incredibly complicated that for a therapist to consciously think through what he was doing, I decided he, he couldn't consciously. It's too complicated. He, could, he just has to learn how to act in the right way. And then later, when I was interviewing therapists, I could see that they knew what to do. But when you ask them why did they do that, they made things up because they just responded in the way they should respond. Okay, yeah. The conceptualization was an afterthought. Always. That's, that's true for us as well. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah. So I tend to think that the way to teach them is to teach them to respond the right way, and then they can later conceptualize something to make sense out of it if they want to. Yeah, I, I think that they are, we have a difference. It could be. Yeah. Here's a problem I see that I wouldn't teach a man how to handle his wife 
at all in the same way I would teach a therapist how to handle wives. Because a man's got to have just his wife to deal with and live. And he doesn't have the purpose of manipulating a wife into a different situation and so on. Whereas, or at least I hope he doesn't. Yeah. And a therapist has a whole series of wives he's going to have to deal with. Yeah. This is one of a series. So he's got to think about himself in relation to that wife. He's got to think about how to triangulate with the husband and the wife. He's got to think about how to persuade that wife to... Well, it is because of that that I think of the student in a different dimension. Well, they're different in a sense, I agree, because they've got to do this differently than a person who's just living. I mean, I would never show, for example, a husband a, a videotape of his discussion with the wife. Of course not. But I would show a therapist his discussion <laughs> with the wife. Yeah. Now that's the difference, really. I'm teaching him how to deal with wives because that's his job. The other guy's just living with the wife. I think that I have at some point a goal of teaching the therapist how to think about universals. Uh, then you know, I, I think that that has been part of my change. I am much less modeling uh, therapist behavior than I did before. I am much more uh, concerned for the therapist's own style than uh, I was before. But I also uh, go in the middle. I am uh, interested in helping the therapist to think. Uh, the two things, the behavior of the therapist, the intervention, and the generalizing of this is something that sure. I teach. I think we both teach them to think. It's a question of, of what that process of thinking is, at, at what level of conceptualization you're dealing with it. Yeah, I think that we started early from the inductive way of how to behave, and uh, sometimes today I watch a videotape and I ask a person to tell me what he had done, uh, and I come with saying, okay, you are thinking correctly, but you are implementing it in a very ineffective way. Or I can come saying, I feel that your way of doing that, it's very, very nice. Sure. And your way of thinking stinks. Or it's sure. just, so th there is two, these are two different skills. Uh, and I think that they are necessary, both of them. The question is how, uh, I think it is possible, and I uh, go for uh, this middle ground.